This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Pretty excited for this week's slate of games across the NFL, and it includes some high-profile matchups with high-profile pl- high profile players involved in them so it's going to be a pretty fun week and that could translate to the prop market as well we're going to break down player props week number 11 with jj zacharies and get his read on this week and get you some good bets for yardage and touchdowns for week number 11 this is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network and numberfire.com my name is jim sonis i am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com joined here once again by jj zacharies and check out his work at lateround.com and find him on twitter at late round qb for as long as we can and also on the late round fantasy football podcast jj twitter is still alive we've made it to week 11 how you doing today I'm good. Christian Watson made me feel a lot better today. Uh, you know, after I've, I've got him in a lot of spots in fantasy, uh, you know, he's he's scoring touchdowns at a totally, totally sustainable rate. I mean, he of course, he's going to score two and a half touchdowns a game moving forward. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll take it. I'll take that that performance. So you got Christian Watson. You got to be happy about that. I wound up pulling the trigger on Titans plus three and a half once it got there. And once Jeffrey Simmons was announced as being in. So everyone's happy. You know, yeah. I mean, unless you're a Packers fan or Todd Downing, like you're probably not happy then. But yeah, like, right. you know, right. the rest of us get to be pretty excited and head into the weekend on a good note. Also, as long as they're able to get there, we get to watch the Bills in a dome. That's yeah. pretty fun. Donovan Peoples Jones in a dome. You talked about him last week, and he went for like ninety-eight yards, doubled his yardage prop. So, I've got I've got a good feeling about Week Eleven. I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah, I'm definitely glad that the like people were complaining about there not being a snow game, and I'm sitting there. I'm like, give me all it wasn't the snow during it anyway. Who cares? Yeah. Like yeah. it it was going to be like just windy and wind, wind games when you can't like aesthetically see anything, just boring. So I know Josh Allen be fine in the wind. He's played in it a lot, but like I don't. I'd rather watch him in a dome. Personally. I was also growing tired of the Devin Singletary jokes. Like I saw the same Devin Singletary joke of it being six feet of snow and him being five foot seven, probably 30 times across Twitter and TikTok and other social media platforms. And I, I was just kind of sick of it. Yeah, exactly. I agree with that as well. So we'll talk about uh, maybe that game later on and talk about Week 11 props in just one second. But first, a reminder that all of our other podcasts for Week 11 are up. We got our full preview with Ryan Williams posted our uh, first look as well, which talked about my bets this week. And also we had some World Cup discussion with Ed Feng there. Also had Ed on for the college football show on Wednesday with Brett McMurphy of the Action Network, formerly of ESPN. You can find all those by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts and also also over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Twisted T and FanDuel have joined forces to bring you a one-of-a-kind contest series that gives you a chance to compete for your share of thousands of dollars in site credit. Introducing Twisted T, a sports betting focused contest series that's in the contest is simple. Each college football game will be assigned line spread and total markets with assigned points to each market. All you have to do is make six selections based on those three markets and earn points for each correct selection you made. If at the end of the day, your score ranks among the best in the contest, you'll be eligible for your share of site credit. Head to FanDuel.com slash Twisted picks and make your picks. And remember, please drink responsibly. Now let's take a look here at week number 11. And... There are some situations here where we have players with imperfect roles, but they're in good matchups. So I wanted to ask you, how much matchup matters for you when you're trying to bet props? Is it a you know a 10% thing? How much does it matter for you with the matchup for an individual? Yeah, so you know, I think that the first thing to remember is that we should always lead with volume. Um, certain mat- matchups can definitely generate volume, but volume is inherently a skill statistic. And you can think of this either from a running back's perspective or a pass catcher perspective. A running back, you know, hopefully talent wins out. Hopefully the coach is putting the most talented running back on the field, the most skillful running back on the field, and therefore that running back will see the most work. But I think wide receiver is a little bit easier to explain because uh, a, a wide receiver earns volume by getting open and earning that target. Uh, you know, a quarterback is not going to necessarily throw to a wide receiver who's covered and who's blanketed. But if a wide receiver can create that separation, he's bound to see more uh, targets and a higher target share. So talent is driving the volume part of that equation and volume is what matters most. But, you know, some matchups can dictate uh, volume going in certain directions. Maybe it's a defense that doesn't cover tight ends very well or Maybe it's a defense that has a number two corner that's down and the number two wide receiver can do really well that week. Um, And and matchup can also help with efficiency. So, um, you know, I I think that 
you know, because you'll get more scoring opportunities, a higher yards per target, et cetera, et cetera. So matchups definitely matter to me. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm leading with volume. I'm leading with things like target share. I'm leading with just overall talent. You know, you can place Justin Jefferson against anyone and he'll be fine, you know. Right. But if you're facing, you know, if Justin Jefferson's playing Atlanta versus playing, uh, you know, a, a team with a better secondary, um, then obviously you can give him a little bit of a boost because it's just an easier matchup, a better matchup. So and, and there's more efficiency involved there. Um, so definitely always lead with volume, always lead with talent and then do factor in matchups. So if I were to give it like a percentage, I'd say it's like a 10 to 20 percent thing, maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, nothing, nothing more than that. I think that the one thing that we see in the fantasy space, at least, is that people take matchup a little bit too far. I matchups to me are more so, um, you know, for like lower tiered players where like, you know, if, if, if there's a, a script that goes a certain way and we might see uh, a number two running back get more work than usual because of that matchup or something like that, then, yeah, I mean, like, you, you know, a, a guy goes from being nothing to being something. Um, but matchup overall, let's just as associate a, uh, a percentage to it and say 10 to 20 percent. Yeah, the reason I wanted to ask is because we got the commanders facing Washington or uh, Houston this week, which is like the best matchup for running back. And like off of that heavy rush attempt game last week, I was like, OK, I kind of want to look towards unders on these guys. But I'm just so like I'm just like rattled. Like, can I bet an under on a running back against Houston? It's just like it's frightening to me. Right. Yeah. I mean, in instances like that, too, I just kind of avoid, you know, sure. I, I'm just you don't have to bet like, anything. You know exactly. Yeah, I'm not yeah. I'm not going to bet everything, I, you know, every single prop that's out there. And, uh, you know, in situations like that, where, whereas otherwise, you know, last week, you know, I was on Saquon and that, in that, uh, yardage total against Houston. And, you know, that's different because where he's, you know, Saquon Barkley versus Brian Robinson, nothing against right. Brian Robinson, but Saquon right. Barkley is a monster and we can feel a lot confident in his skill and his volume that's coming his way. Whereas we can't feel that same comfort with a, with a Washington backer. Saquon Barkley could have been at like two and a half yards per carry and still hit the over on his yeah, rushing yardage yeah. prop last week, but he he didn't because he's quite good at football. Other thing I want to talk about is players moving to new teams because there are guys like Chase Claypool and Kadarius Tony who are in really interesting spots this week. Tony due to injuries for the other wide receivers and the Chiefs, Claypool because of the matchup. And I think that they're intriguing in these situations, but it's hard to know what their role will be because Claypool's role actually went backwards a little bit in uh, this most recent game. That was concerning. Tony, I don't know. Like he, he in theory could be getting work this week with Nico Harbin on IR, but it's hard to know. So when you're trying to judge what a role will be for those kinds of guys, what are you looking at when trying to project them in the short term going forward? I'd say there's two things. Uh, the first thing is just who are they competing against and what are they competing with? Um, you know, in, in Tony's case, uh, you know, with these injuries going on, it sounds pretty bad for Juju this week. You know, yeah. overall, you know, we don't know for sure right now at the time of this recording, but, you know, he's likely not going to play. Miko Hardman's obviously on IR. And so you look at what's going on in that offense. You have MVS who looks to be healthy. You know, he had like limited practice and such so far this week. But let's say MVS goes. I mean, it's, it's not that much. I mean, Justin Watson and these guys who – you know, haven't gotten a lot of run historically within the NFL. So you can feel confident that not only can Tony overcome that talent, uh, but at the same time, he's at least trending in the right direction. You know, he went right. from that that first week when he joined Kansas City, he had like an 8% tar or snap share. And then this past week, it bumped up to like 44, 45%. Um, and so the, the trend, you know, the arrow is at least pointing up for Kadarius Tony. And so you can then you know, just, just be rational about it and hope that the team is rational that, okay, you know, he's increasing. I, I don't think we can assume that he's going to be like a full-time guy because if you give him team context too, you know, the chiefs love to rotate their players and their personnel around. So it's not like we're going to see 95% snap shares from guys who aren't elite within that offense. Um, and so, you know, you can still project a higher snap share than for a guy like Tony because of circumstance and because of talent um, and what he's overcoming. Um, and say, you know, maybe maybe a 60, 65 percent snap share or something like that this week. And then obviously, if he's seeing more snaps, there's more production. And he's obviously been incredibly efficient since joining uh, Kansas City. He has been efficient really throughout his career. Yeah. Um, the problem with Chase Claypool, then, you know, this is this is just an example, obviously, but it's going case by case. And, and you're saying, OK, Chase Claypool, not a ton to overcome. Byron Pringle's back. And, uh, you know, there's not like there's it's, it's not like there's much out of Darno, outside of Darnell Mooney within that offense. The problem, though, is that he trended in the like you said, he trended in the wrong direction this past week. He barely he barely played. Um, and so you can't feel that confident 
and him all of a sudden seeing this massive, massive boost the next week. And so in situations like that, I generally just avoid, yeah. um, you know, I think that you could hypothetically bet unders, but I think the market's going to generally reflect what happened the previous week anyway. Um, you know, there's a chance then obviously that Claypool plays a lot this week. And, you know, we, we run into this in fantasy football all the time where, you know, Traylon Burks is a good example, actually, where, you know, his, his work the previous week was fine, but you still, you know, you want to see it over multiple weeks to make sure what, you know, to, to have a concrete feel about what his role looks like and such. And so, you know, I benched Traylon Burks in a lot of places last night and a lot of people did, uh, you know, against Green Bay and he had a great game and that's fine yeah. because you know that you have Traylon Burks moving forward, right. but you know, it could have gone South too. You know, you just don't know what these coaches are thinking, how they're going to deploy these guys, et cetera. You can only work off of what you know. And so I think the two big things though are what's the competition and then where are things trending? And for both Tony and Claypool, the competition is beatable, but right. Tony's trending in one direction and Claypool's trending in another. And with Tony too, like Marquez Valdez Scanling is not a target earner. You were talking mm -hmm. about talent, you know, earning earning targets. And like, yeah, not that he's untalented, but his role isn't like conducive to a high target share. So the guys he's on the field with are also not going to be taking away a lot of looks, yep. which I think is encouraging uh, for Tony as well. Okay, we talked about a couple situations uh, with the Chiefs uh, pass catchers and the uh, foul or the Bears pass catchers. Uh, which other situations are you looking at this week? Try to find some undervalued guys once props there are posted. Yeah, so uh, a big story is uh, Ezekiel Elliott's return uh, in the Dallas backfield. Tony Pollard's averaged uh, a 73% running back rush share without Zeke over the last two weeks. That number was about 38% with Zeke, so a pretty massive difference in the percentage of running back rushes that he was seeing. Um, but I think that I, you know, we need to, to note at least that as the season's gone on, Pollard has captured you know more and more of that backfield even before this Ezekiel right. Elliott injury happened. So I wouldn't look at what he did across the entire season without Zeke and say that's how it's going to be with Zeke back. And not only that, but this is Zeke's first game back. We don't know what that workload is going to really look like, if he's going to be fully, fully healthy. He's apparently going to be wearing a brace, all that kind of stuff. So I kind of see this being like a 50-50 split this week between the two guys if you can find value in that. Um, you know, I, I, I would assume that Pollard is going to play more of a pass catching role as he's played all season long. So I still see more juice and more value in Tony Pollard overall. Um, you know, just, just in terms of, of production than Ezekiel Elliott with his returns. So that's one thing to definitely keep an eye on. Another one is, you know, we don't know for sure if he's going to be back at the time of this recording, but Hollywood Brown, uh, he's potentially returning, you know, Zach Ertz is out, um, you know, and, that, and that's going to free up about 20% of the team's targets. He's run the most routes in the NFL at tight end. But DeAndre Hopkins, a 33% target share per game since returning to action. Rondell Moore, over his last two games, he's at, he's hit at least a 30% target share. You don't see two players hit a 50% target share in their offense combined very often, let alone a 60% target share. So, you know, Hollywood Brown, and going back to the targets being earned, Hollywood Brown is a good wide receiver. This is not someone, you know, who's not going to command a 20, 25%, you know, in that range target share. Um, and so, you know, if you look at it from that perspective, I think that you have to bump down DeAndre Hopkins and Rondell Moore at least a little bit, um, especially probably someone like Rondell, whereas DeAndre Hopkins at least is going to have some sort of baseline because he's just so talented. Um, it is good for those three wide receivers that Zach Ertz is out. Um, I do think that they're, you know, they can maintain some of this to some degree, but I really don't think a guy like Rondell Moore is going to be able to maintain a 30% target share if Hollywood Brown is healthy. Um, and then the last one is no Khalil Herbert, which means David Montgomery is likely going to be the bell cow in the Chicago offense. Um, Tristan Ebner, a uh, rookie who's, who's pretty explosive, pretty fun running back. Um, you know, he's played sort of a pass catching role uh, this season within that offense. Um, but Khalil Herbert has not done that. Khalil Herbert's been an early down back. He hasn't seen a target in each of his last three games. He's just been a grinder on the ground. Um, and so I don't think Tristan Ebner is just going to walk in and take a Khalil Herbert workload. So I think a lot of that rushing production and that rushing work is going to go to David Montgomery. And he's a player that we've seen in that role already before. I mean, he's, he's seen bell cow workloads throughout his career. So I feel pretty confident in David Montgomery sort of being that bell cow for Chicago this week without Khalil Herbert. Uh, going back to the Cardinal situation too, uh, DeAndre Hopkins popped up on the injury report on Thursday with a hamstring injury. I didn't see anything to make it seem super concerning, but that could also lend itself to like, hey, if Marquise Brown is activated, yeah. he could jump back into a big target share because what we've seen Hopkins and Moore do 
with the Zach Ertz injury this past week. So we won't know on Brown um, because they don't have to activate him until like 4 p.m. Eastern on Monday, which is super annoying. Um, But if he does wind up being activated and Hopkins is still banged up, that is a situation maybe you buy actively into Marquise Brown in his first game back. Uh, With the Zeke thing too, they play Thursday on Thanksgiving. That might Mm. also put a lid on his usage. They've said that won't impact whether he's active, the fact they play Thursday, but I'd bet it's probably going to impact his usage. So I think that being high on Pollard, even as Zeke winds up being full go, that could be pretty advantageous. I I agree with that as well. Let's turn to the yardage market for week number 11. JJ, where are you seeing value there right now? Yeah, so you can get Paris Campbell's line at 36 and a half receiving yards in a few places right now. I like the over. Um, You know, the Eagles... You know, obviously a tough matchup for wide receivers. They've been one of the best at limiting uh, receiving yards to the position this season, Uh, but they've been more beatable in the slot than the perimeter this year, which is where Paris Campbell plays. They rank 12th in the NFL in percentage of targets allowed to the slot. Paris Campbell has played 79% of his snaps from the slot this year, and he's been connecting really well with Matt Ryan. Uh, Over his last three games with Matt Ryan, he's averaged a 27% target share per game. He's averaged about 68 receiving yards per game. So I feel like that 36 and a half number is pretty low. So give me the over. And that line has moved. It was six and a half. It's now seven, which would further indicate that they may be more pass heavy in this game because we saw JT go nuts this past week and they're going to want to run the football. But will they be able to against a very good Eagles offense, even though Dallas Goddard, like they're probably going to throw at some point. And like with the rapport Ryan and Campbell have had, I feel like that's a very good situation to turn to. Yeah, for sure. All right, what are the yardage props you're seeing here at week 11? Um, I'm going to go to Brandon Cooks, and I'm definitely not going to go over with a Brandon <laughs> Cooks prop right now. So his his numbers at 54 and a half, and this is at a lot of books as well. I'm going to hit the under here. Um, it's a better than average matchup. There's no doubt against Washington, but Cooks is averaging less than 49 receiving yards per game this year. So that's that's the under right there. He's hit this number in three of eight games this season. He's also not hit this number in three of his last four. Um, and, you know, there's there's definitely a uh, a correlation uh, with that and his lack of production of late with fewer looks in the offense across his first five games this year. He never dipped below a 20 percent target share in any single game. Over his last three, his single game high is a 20.7% target share. So, you know, he's not seeing as many looks in the offense. Um, You know, Nico Collins, someone who uh, I don't think people realize, we talked about this, I think, on this show before, but Nico Collins is averaging more receiving yards per game in that offense than Brandon Cooks is. And I think, you know, if you look at books, it's usually Brandon Cooks, then Nico Collins. So, you know, I don't think this matchup is bad. Uh, but I just don't really love Brandon Cooks in this situation right now. So I'm going to go the under there. And then the last one that I have is one that I actually talked about a little bit earlier, which is David Montgomery. Um, I'm going to go over 61 and a half rushing yards for David Montgomery. I feel like that number's uh, pretty low right now. Um, you know, he hasn't hit that number in three straight games, uh, but he also hasn't seen half of the Bears running backs and two of his la- or running back rushes in two of his last three. Over the last three, though, Herbert and Montgomery, if you look at both of those guys combined, assuming, you know, obviously Khalil Herbert's not not playing this weekend, they combined for 152 rushing yards, 59 rushing yards, and 94 rushing yards. So the median there between those two running backs, far, far greater than 61 and a half rushing yards. Now, clearly, David Montgomery, this is not how projections work. You don't just say David Montgomery gets all of Khalil Herbert's work no matter what. Um, But at the same time, you could look at, you know, an 80%, 90% running back rush share for David Montgomery this week. I don't think that would be a crazy projection for him just given that backfield and given the depth chart um and if that's the case then he would still be getting over that mark given what they've done in recent weeks and then on top of that the matchup is beautiful yeah. uh it's, it's atlanta i mean this is a team that you can throw on and run on and we know that chicago loves to run the football they're one of the most run heavy teams that we've seen or the most run heavy team over the last like decade and a half so i think this number really should be closer to like 70 yards and you're getting it at 61 and a half so i'm gonna hit the over I think the other two things to consider with Montgomery are we did see a model for them earlier this year of what they'll do with Ebner. That was when Montgomery was out. And in that game, I think Herbert had 20 compare 20 carries compared to eight for Ebner. And they clearly value Montgomery more than they value Herbert because the snap share has still been like not double, but pretty close to Herbert's recently. So they view him more than that. So you expect a wider split than 20 to eight there. And other thing is uh, Justin Fields has spoken twice this week about how tired his legs are yes. from running as much. So we're probably going to see a slight reduction there. Part of the reason the the combined rushing yardage for Montgomery and Herbert's been a bit lower is because Fields has done it all himself. And 
he needs a breather at some point. Like yeah, I feel bad sure. for this guy. So I think that both those things do point towards uh, Montgomery, a pretty good role for this week. What about touchdown props? What are you seeing there this week? I got one, another long shot. I love the long shots on this show. Um, Garrett Wilson right now is plus 280 as an anytime touchdown. You can get that on FanDuel, actually. It's actually one of the better spots for this bet uh, is over on FanDuel. Uh, but he hit a season high 115 receiving yards against New England the last time that these two teams met. Um, he scored a touchdown in just one game this year, despite 521 receiving yards. Um, he's got an expected touchdown total that's closer to four when he scored two because he had two touchdowns in that one game. Uh, so he is a regression candidate, technically. Um, he's averaging a 27% target share per game over his last four. Corey Davis is someone who should still probably be out this week, which is pretty big. You know, he's getting better looks in this offense. Garrett Wilson is without Corey Davis. Um, you know, like I said, I like my long shot anytime touchdowns. I think plus 280 is, is pretty good juice for him. Yeah, the two games they've played without Corey Davis so far this year, Garrett Wilson, a 28% target share. He does have 13% inside the red zone, so not nothing there. Um, and that number could go up because Tyler Conklin's at 25%, which seems a little bit high. And I do have the Jets plus three and a half. So I need uh, I need some Jets touchdowns. And I wouldn't mind if they were Garrett Wilson for my daily fantasy lineups as well. All righty. That is all that we have here for week number 11. I think it's a pretty fun little offering here. I feel good about Paris Campbell. I like the Montgomery stuff. I need, I need Garrett Wilson. I don't, I, I don't know if I don't care if I like it. I just need it. Um, so pretty excited to see how these go. Uh, JJ want to thank you for the time as always. And good luck to you across week 11. Thanks Jim. Appreciate it. You can find JJ on Twitter at late round QB. We'll update the, at the Mastodon uh, username next week on that one. You can find JJ's work at late round.com and on the late round fantasy football podcast. I'm on Twitter at Jim Sonis. Also be sure to check out our NFL week 11 preview and our week 12 college football preview up in the cover in the spread podcast feed. But for now, good luck to all of you with your bets. We'll talk to you once again, Monday to preview 49ers and Cardinals. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 